No, this is shaky. Good afternoon, I'm Darrell West, a senior fellow in the Center for Technology Innovation at the Brookings Institution. And I'm pleased to welcome you to our forum today on the dangers posed by AI and disinformation during elections. The 2024 campaign is shaping up as one of the most impactful US races in recent memory. There are vast differences in the visions offered by the various candidates and people around the world are paying close attention to the American elections. At the same time, there has been an emergence of new generative AI tools designed to create, among other things, fake content, videos, and audio tapes. This is a particular challenge in 2024 because literally about half of the world is going to be voting this year. There are major elections in the United States, India, Indonesia, Mexico, Pakistan, the European Union, and a number of other countries. Many people across the world are worried about these elections and uh, fear that they may end up being decided based on false narratives. And all these developments raise interesting questions about possible US risks to our own election 2024 and the role that disinformation could play in that campaign. My Brookings colleague, Elaine Kmark, and I are, uh, have a book on disinformation that is coming out this summer. Uh, we argue that we need to take disinformation seriously. It does represent possible threats to our election. We look at the organized networks that are behind disinformation, and we also outline the lucrative nature of disinformation. There are large ecosystems out there that are finding the distribution of false narratives to be quite profitable. And so therefore, we suggest, we have a number of different recommendations in our book, but we suggest that if we really want to address this, we have to think about both the organized networks and the financial and political incentives that people have to spread uh, this type of information. To help us understand these issues, we're uh, delighted to be joined today by three distinguished experts. Uh, the Honorable Shauna Broussard is a commissioner at the Federal Election Commission, where she has served since 2020. Uh, prior to that, she has worked as a New Orleans assistant uh, uh, district attorney and also an attorney advisor at the Internal Revenue Service. I think you like to work at non-controversial agencies, right? Yeah, it's, it's IRS, my kind of thing. <laughs> so. Uh, and uh, I should also note, in 2023, she helped launch an FEC effort to develop guidelines for the use of AI in campaign advertising. Dr. Sohail Faizi is an uh, associate professor of computer science at the University of Maryland, and there he is the director of the Reliable AI Lab and focuses on ways to develop trustworthy AI, how to develop explanatory AI, how to deal with questions of racial bias uh, in AI, uh, all of which are very hot topics. Matt Perrault is the director of the Center on Technology Policy at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. There he serves as a professor of practice in the School of Information and Library Sciences, and he writes on online expression and political advertising, among other topics. If you have a question for our panelists, you can email them to events at brookings.edu or tweet at the hashtag AI elections. So today we're going to discuss the election situation and ways to address possible uh, threats. I'll start with uh, Shauna. So we know that disinformation is shaping up as a major problem uh, this year. How should we address the challenges related to campaign disinformation? Well, we start off with the, the easiest question first. Um, <laughs> how should we address it? Uh, the, the way that it is being addressed now is that there is state legislature that's coming through. 14 states have been able to do something um, that have worked in concepts of how to include disclaimers that work on content or transparency. We've had some really interesting legislation that was put out just last week by the Klobuchar, it's a bipartisan, um, Senator Klobuchar Murkowski, that go to the heart of what I think is one of the ways that we can not just combat, but inform about AI and misinformation, and that's through the effort of disclaimers. Uh, there's a big controversy that deals with First Amendment rights when you're dealing with speech, and particularly when dealing with political speech. But one thing that the courts have said that when it comes to disclosure, disclaimers are still okay. 
And so that is the thing that I'm hopeful for most when I see it through the state and through a federal um, efforts that are being done is uh, the push for disclaimers. So I know that there are some possible FEC guidelines on the AI use in 2024, and I know this is an ongoing rulemaking process, so you can't really say uh, very much about it. But I'm just curious about the public comments period, how it has gone, how many comments the commission is receiving, and just kind of the general nature of the reaction so far. Sure. There was a petition that was filed by a, a public watchdog group, Public Citizen is the name of the organization, and that it was a petition that would allow through a regulation that is pre-existing for fraudulent misrepresentation or solicitation for using that as a means to be able to regulate AI. So the petition went through the notice stage. We uh, put it out for comments, and we received very healthy comments, 2,400 comments to be uh, exact, which shows that everyone is interested by this topic. Um, you had comments that were received from both sides. So I'm always happy to see where there is a collective interest um, regarding this. But I will say that overwhelmingly the comments were positive about moving forward with some type of regulation for artificial intelligence. Um, because this is a pending rulemaking, there is very little more that I can say about that. But I, I do say that, that there has been there's been rampant discussion in the commission, so we look forward to, to further discussion and moving forward on that. Well, it's impressive to see all the interest in that. I'm not surprised you've gotten 2,400 uh, comments. There's definitely a lot of public anxiety around this topic. Uh, so, Heil, you seek to develop trustworthy AI. What do you see as the possible AI-related problems in 2024, and how should we think about those issues? First of all, thanks for having me on the panel. Uh, obviously, there are several um, risks that AI can uh, uh, impose. Maybe the biggest one is the creation of misinformation and disinformation using generative AI models. So I can tell you, um, in the last couple of years, there has been a sea change in the quality of these generative AI models uh, for text, for images, for <coughs> videos, and for audios. Uh, so not only they can generate realistic samples, but they don't leave, uh, in many cases, visible or invisible signatures on the content so that we can use them in order to flag such content later on. So that's one of the, 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 the main issues. Uh, there are some other issues uh, that amplifies this risk, uh, the scale, the speed, and the flexibility of these models. So these generative models, they can be used to generate not one sample, not 10 samples, they can generate thousands and millions of samples in seconds. And they can generate it in a way to maximize the impact by targeting certain profile of voters and to uh, basically do the voter manipulation uh, to maximize the impact of the disinformation. And uh, maybe the third aspect that is less, uh, in my opinion, talked about is the risk that AI defense to combat this problem can uh, create itself. So there are a lot of detectors, AI detectors, uh, for different modalities like text, images, videos, and audios. And uh, we have been studying their reliability uh, for a while. And bottom line is that these detectors are not reliable. So they have a huge um, false positive rates. That means that if you have real images, if you have real content, if you have real videos maybe about a candidate that come to light before the election. Uh, so that content, if it is pushed through one of these detectors and it is flagged as AI generated falsely, that can basically be used to falsify real evidence. That's another risk uh, that uh, AI can create. And in my opinion, that is less uh, studied and less um, uh, highlighted uh, in, in especially policy, policy domains. Thank you. Uh, Matt, you have been a long-term observer of tech policy. What worries you about AI in the 2024 elections? So thanks so much, Daryl, for inviting me to attend, and Catalina for your help organizing the event. I really appreciate it. It's an honor to be here. Um, so <clears throat> I approach this maybe first from uh, some one step back, which is how do we think about evaluating public policy 
problems. I've been motivated and excited recently by the Knight Foundation's new investments in translational work. They're actually starting a center here in DC um, in partnership with Georgetown that will be directed by Alyssa Cooper that's focused on translational work between the academy and public policymakers. Um, I think there's still questions about what translational actually means in practice. But the way that our center has interpreted that is identifying what the arguments are around potential harms related to technology, what are the interventions that have been proposed, mm -hmm. and then looking at the literature, what the literature says about those potential harms and about the efficacy of those interventions, and developing a public policy framework based on that evidence. It sounds simple, I think, in theory, but it's not something actually that I think when you look out in the ecosystem, you see done as much, the link between the research and the public policy arguments around harms and interventions. So if you apply that framework to generative AI and political ads, what do you see? And when when we did that at our center, we looked, we identified four arguments mainly that have been made about potential harms related to generative AI and political ads. Harms related to scale, the volume of misinformation in political ads, harms related to authenticity, how lifelike, how authentic do those ads look, uh, personalization, how targeted can you get messaging, and bias. And what we found when we looked at the literature is that for three of those four harms, uh, personalization, authenticity, and scale, the harms are likely overstated. And the primary reason for that, hold on to your seats, is that misinformation has limited persuasive effect. That is, yeah, exactly. That, um, the gas from the audience. Um, that <laughs> finding um, is well supported in the literature. In every audience where I've said that, people say, yeah, but I know a thing. Or I thought this, I, I saw this ad, or I talked to a person who saw this ad. Again, the literature is fairly conclusive that misinformation has limited persuasive effects. It doesn't really change people's minds. It can affect behavior, but it doesn't really change people's minds. That understanding from the social science literature, I think, can inform how we think about the problem. I think when we're, we're told, when we're reading news about this issue, we're told that the main thing that we should be concerned about is Elon Musk's decisions or decisions of other CEOs and leaders of tech companies about misinformation policy and how that will affect a presidential race between Biden and Trump. The likelihood of that, the likelihood that you see misinformation on X or Meta or TikTok, which today is the day of TikTok, um, or TikTok, um, that changes your mind and causes you to vote for a different candidate is very, very low. So what are concerns in the literature? What does the literature suggest are concerns that we should be paying more attention to? We identified two. One is bias. Bias gets a lot of attention in AI generally, but less, I think, in, related to bias in political advertising and its impacts. And the second is something that I think gets extremely limited amount of attention, which is potential harms in down ballot races. So on the day that our center released this report, um, Lots of, it was election day 2023, lots of focus on upcoming national race. But I think where this was more meaningful was probably in the Durham City Council race where I was counting, where I was casting a ballot um, uh, that day. <clears throat> um, the literature also has stuff to say, to tell us, I think, about interventions. So um, user facing messaging or uh, a provenance after attribution, so understanding disclaimers, watermarks, and those types of tools, we think are likely a, le, unlikely to be a silver bullet. And that's because often people don't observe uh, disclaimers. If they do observe them, they're often not persuaded by them, again, for the same reason that they're not persuaded by misinformation. And so that's an area, I think, where we need a lot more research to understand if that public policy tool is likely to be useful. The other thing that I think, um, this is a little bit less the social science literature, but certainly the legal literature, is that there's, there are many, many proposals now that I think run directly into a First Amendment buzzsaw. I don't quite understand exactly why that is. There's like an active debate now about whether First Amendment jurisprudence is too broad. Maybe that's the case. But it is very clear that when you try to pass regulation that is content-based, it will be subject to heightened scrutiny in a court. And that means that the likelihood that if that law is passed, it will survive judicial review is limited. So when you design a law around deceptive political content, for instance, that might be desirable from a social standpoint, but it will run into significant judicial scrutiny, and it will be very hard for that law to get held up, uh, for that law to survive judicial review. Thank you. That is a great uh, background, and I think that helps put this whole uh, topic in uh, context. Uh, you mentioned a couple of uh, possible problems related to bias and down ballot uh, races. I'll add a couple of other areas that I am particularly worried about in 2024, uh, which is a turnout effect 
Right. and what I will call an electoral college effect, which I'll explain in a minute. The turnout effect that I worry about this year is I agree that most people actually are not going to be affected by misinformation or disinformation, uh, especially at the presidential level. 90 to 95 percent of Americans have made up their minds on Trump versus Biden. Nothing is going to move them off of that. The question is really the last 5 or 10 percent. And then there's also that question of turnout, because we're already seeing concerns among African Americans, especially uh, male African Americans, about that choice uh, and about the Democratic Party and what they have done or not done uh, for African Americans. And then also young people. Uh, in the Biden, in, in the famous Biden fake robocall that went to New Hampshire, it was designed not to persuade people about support for a particular candidate, but whether they should turn out in the New Hampshire primary. So I do worry about turnout effects. The Electoral College, I think, poses a unusual uh, potential problem in the United States in the sense that if we just had a popular direct vote for the president, I actually would be much less worried about disinformation. But because of the Electoral College, we all anticipate this is going to be a close race. This presidential election may come down to 25,000 or 50,000 votes in two or three states. So I'm not worried about the impact of disinformation on that first 99 percent. But what about that last 25,000, uh, those last 50,000 people who actually could be decisive? This is purely a function of the Electoral College. If we did not have that, that problem would entirely disappear. But we have the Electoral College. So I, I do have some worries on that front. Uh, there are a number of large tech companies that have recently come together to pledge on a voluntary basis to take active steps to combat campaign disinformation, uh, particularly this year. Although I should note, Twitter slash X is a notice, notable non-signatory uh, to this agreement. They did not uh, sign uh, that pledge. But I'm just curious, and I'll throw this uh, open to any on the panel who want to address it. How should we view that agreement? Is it sufficient to protect U.S. consumers? And there are a number of firms that claim digital watermarking uh, you know, putting kind of the the origin of a particular event. So that if there's something fake or nefarious that comes out, we can then trace back the origins of that. Is digital watermarking a way to address this issue? Any of you who want to address this? Well, I, I think from the perspective that we don't have legislation for our state or our national level that can address this, although 14 states do have something. I appreciate private sector t stepping up in their capacity to be able to provide some of these things. I share the concern that you mentioned about does the digital watermark really give the individual reader the information that they need, or do they have the understanding of what this actually accomplishes? Or more important, are they going to click the button to be able to follow it where you need to go to get this. Um, but until you have the step up of legislation, this is the best option that we have available for us. So I do appreciate that, but I don't see that it's going to be sufficient to resolve the problems that we're having. I think that they've done a step up in the sense of it's enough, but they are waiting for that regulation to come their way, if it can. Uh, maybe I can uh, comment on the technical aspect of, uh, for example, some of these technologies like digital watermarking, other types of you know, uh, tools to be able to flag AI-generated content. Right? So uh, we studied watermarking for both text and images in the uh, last couple of uh, research works that we have done. What we found is that uh, basically the technology is quite unreliable. Uh, it means that, uh, yes, obviously you can uh, embed a signal into the generation, into the generation process of this content. Uh, but first of all, that signal can be easily removed. They we propose some methods. Many other people they have also proposed methods. Uh, so adversaries, whenever they want to, you know, generate a content, they can do like a very lightweight process, erase that signal, you know, altogether. And secondly, as I mentioned, they're subject to spoofing attack, meaning that now I can uh, take a real image and maybe add a small amount of noise to it, and it will be flagged as watermark image from a Google model or from a meta model or from an open AI model. So that can be used to, to falsify uh, real content. Uh, so 
the other aspect of it, I think my uh, mic just died. Uh, so the other aspect of it. It uh, came back. Oh, <laughs> it came back to life. Okay, maybe I'm you know being censored by you know <laughs> big tech. <laughs> That'll um, teach you to say controversial things. Yeah. <laughs> so, but the other aspect of it, okay, you may think that okay, maybe with the right amount of investment in digital watermarking, we can reach to the level that we'll have this reliable watermarking be used, will be done with this problem. So what we have shown is that it is a fundamental limitation of these technologies. It doesn't mean that uh, the problem is going to get easier. It is not going to be, you know, uh, you know, be solved uh, with even like you know, great amount of investment because uh, there's a fundamental hardness in reliably solving this problem, and we have characterized uh, such fundamental limitations for just using that technology. I'm not saying the technology is not useful in general, but if you're just using, for example, watermarking to defend against you know, AI-generated content and you rely on it, uh, it is not going to reliably solve our problems. And in many cases, it can create many other problems that, uh, uh, that have not been uh, foreseen in the development side. Yeah. Matt, your views? Uh, can we trust the tech companies to protect us Except for Twitter. <laughs> so um, I guess I like, have one thumb up and one thumb down for the initiative. So on the thumb upside, these are hard issues. And I think one of the main things that we needed to do, which I mean in a robust way, not a throwaway, do nothing way, is we need to learn. Um, and learning can happen, I think, in industry from working with other companies and trying to understand what what have other companies tried and to, to address various different challenges. and when they've tried things, what has worked and what has failed. Um, I, do, I, I do have some skepticism about it for two reasons. So one is like a pretty sort of a macro point, which is um, there's been a lot of convergence in content moderation. I actually don't have a strong view either, either way exactly on whether Elon Musk's ownership of Twitter now X is a positive thing. Um, a lot of people think no, I'm not skeptical of that point of view necessarily. Um, but I do think it's, there's a value in having more competition in content moderation practices and having more options for users to have choices that go in a different direction from a direction of uh, where other companies are going, which I think has largely been convergence. So I do think active competition in content moderation is helpful. The other thing that I think is um, worth paying attention to is the political backdrop against which that accord um, happened. And so if like two or three weeks ago it was in uh, at the Supreme Court, it was net choice Florida and Texas cases. Last week and this week is sort of TikTok universe. Um, next week will be job owning, uh, the job owning world, where the Supreme Court is hearing a case about pressure that tech companies received from government officials that allegedly caused them to change content moderation practices. Um, when I worked at Facebook, that was not a like once in a while thing. That was an everyday thing. And it wasn't a US government thing. It was a every government in the world thing. And it wasn't a Republican thing or a Democratic thing. It was every single day pressure from policymakers to change your practices. Um, often in ways that the government couldn't have effectuated through the democratic process because of the First Amendment. So again, if you're trying to regulate deceptive practices from a congressional perspective, that will run into significant strict scrutiny, headwinds in court. So you see pressure from members of Congress, pressures from the administration, and then a group of tech companies coming together to address deceptive practices, which is essentially content-based regulation. That may be a positive thing. Again, I think that kind of collaboration is good overall. But I'm really wary of situations where the government exerts pressure on companies to take action that they're not able to do through the democratic process because of the First Amendment. And I'm glad you're highlighting the role of judges in this. You're exactly right. There are a bunch of cases that are winding their way through the federal courts, and some of them already have reached the Supreme Court. A lot of people are focused on Congress and what uh, they can or should do, what state legislatures should do. People need to pay attention to the courts, because on a lot of tech issues, in the short run, it's going to be judges that are making decisions and not uh, legislators. Uh, these cases are not necessarily going to help us on the disinformation front this year, but just in terms of what tech policy looks like going forward, uh, that is definitely something to watch. Uh, I give a lot of talks uh, on uh, disinformation, and what people always want to know in the Q&A is, OK, we understand there are potential problems and there are different aspects of the problems. What do we do about it? So from a, either a legislative or a regulatory standpoint, there are a couple of different approaches uh, that have been uh, suggested and in some places at the state level been enacted. So there are a handful of states that have actually adopted 
transparency and disclosure requirements in terms of the use of uh, AI-generated images in campaign advertising. Uh, the idea is the disclosure regime is common in elections in the sense we have disclosure of campaign finance, on television ads, you know, there's the tagline at the end of I approve uh, this ad. And so a lot of people say it makes sense to add disclosure uh, to the use of uh, AI generated content uh, in campaign communications. But then some also suggest that's not sufficient. Like letting us know that we're about to be manipulated does not necessarily protect us from the potential harm of the manipulation. So there actually are a few places, and I would highlight Minnesota as an example, where the state legislature actually has already passed a law trying to get at that harm issue. Uh, they basically have uh, prohibited the, the non-consensual use of a candidate's image in a manipulated sort of way 90 days prior to an election, either a primary election or a general election, without the consent of that candidate. And so it's basically trying to prevent the deceptive practices like, you know, we already have seen Nikki Haley's head put on the body of a naked woman to try and shame her. Uh, we've seen a digital manipulation of images. So Minnesota is actually trying to get at that harm question. So the question I have for the panel is on the legislative front, we have transparency and disclosure. We have some aspects of harm that are being addressed. I'm just curious your thoughts on uh, either the effectiveness of those approaches, or are there other things we should be thinking about doing? Well, I, I think they have the potential to be very effective, but I also think that what they are doing is that they're regulating it within a specific time frame. And so by keeping in that time frame, seems to have the possibility to be able to avoid some of the First Amendment concerns that you're mentioning. Um, and keeping it in a time frame that's more effective to what the election is happening. So I, I see great positive uh, what's happening with those interests. But I'm always more appreciative of the states that have chosen not to go the content route, but the informational route. And I know that we just said, you know, is it really going to affect anything if it has a disclaimer? But I, but I think that it's going to affect the ability for the reader to be able to assess whether they choose to or not participate with this communication. So... And by the information level, what do you mean? Are you talking about states trying to promote real information? Uh, or what do you the mean? Informational level, meaning the, the level of the disclaimer being the time frame specifically is what I'm talking about. And that specific time frame tied towards the primary or tied toward an election is oftentimes going to be those considerations that court look at and find a permissible measure. Yep. Yeah, no, that definitely makes sense. Uh, because there also are efforts among secretaries of state, among several different states, to put out positive information, like the election takes place on this date. Uh, these are the polling uh, places, because we're likely to see some uh, misinformation associated with just election processes. Uh, any thoughts you have on uh, Yeah, regulation? maybe I'll uh, comment on the technical part of it. You know, uh, just, you know, in my opinion, uh, in campaigns like any other businesses, we should not ban or police uh, in a strict way the use of AI tools and AI, um, uh, AI uh, methods because these can improve the efficiency of the you know, workflows. Maybe a candidate you know, has some ideas you know, and uh, they can use AI uh, models to present the idea in the best possible way to, to the voters. But at the, at the end of it, I think the disclosure is important because the responsibility of whatever piece of content in terms of text or videos or images, it should fall uh, basically on, on the candidate. So the candidate shouldn't you know, say, oh, you know, maybe a part of it becomes uh, controversial and say, you know, I didn't write this. We used an AI model uh, and that was written by the AI model. So uh, whatever content that is being produced, it should should be checked and you know it, there should be a disclosure with respect to the harm um, that's basically for me a gray area because um, how do you how can you uh, verify that because um, you can create contents as I mentioned in some cases it may be very difficult to uh, to know if it was real or not so that part um, is um, is a gray area for me. If we could know, okay, so there's a harm in this content that is generated and we have evidence about it, absolutely, I think that shouldn't be used, uh, but that can, in, that can maybe um, have some issues with, with the free speech and with the free, free expression, especially if you are not talking about the official campaigns, if you are talking about 
uh, ordinary voters and users, you know, what if, you know, they use some AI models to generate memes about Biden and Trump and, you know, all of these things. Should, should we police it? Should we ban it? Um, in my opinion, um, we shouldn't, and uh, perhaps just to impose it, I don't think we can have a reliable way to, uh, to impose such restrictions. Well, the good news is on that front, all the legislation has an exemption for political satire. So if there are funny uh, memes out there, that's okay, even if yeah. they are completely false. Yeah. Matt, your it thoughts? It that it's content-based and will be subject <laughs> to strict scrutiny, unfortunately. Um, so I can take through the recommendations that we included in our report, which I think are like um, extremely unsexy, and part of what we're trying to do at our center is make these kinds of recommendations sexier. I think you can imagine sort of like a, a three-circle Venn diagram, and I'm pretty sure this set of recommendations fits within two of them. Um, what does the, what the empirical research suggest might be good directions of travel, and then what's lawful? The third part of the Venn diagram is really critical, which is what's politically saleable, and I'm not sure if these fit into that category, less because they are politically offensive and more because do they check the box when a politician is trying to take action on the issue. Um, I am concerned that there is very limited space that, that, that is at the intersection of those three circles. Um, so we had a series of recommendations across two categories. One was targeting harms rather than technologies, and then the second bucket is around learning. So in the first set of things, um, we don't have a federal criminal law on voter suppression. We should have a federal criminal law on voter suppression. Um, you can actively enforce existing federal civil rights law um, when uh, AI is used to violate federal civil rights law. I think that that is, like, might seem mundane. I don't think that it is because prosecutors need to figure out how to build cases when AI is used in discriminatory ways that violate federal civil rights law. And so, like, in the White House executive order, for instance, where they're calling for coordination across various different parts of the federal government to help prosecutors build cases, I think that's the kind of thing we need and is a really important, robust thing to consider. Um, we need to, Daryl, as you said, flood the zone at the state and local level with factual content. I actually talked to someone in North Carolina last week who um, said that a DJ in, uh, in, in one uh, part of North Carolina in, uh, referenced false information on when polls were closing, the idea, the, the, the um, what people thought was that this was not intentional, but it, it, but it happened, it was negligent, and they activated an information network to try to, um, to, to, to provide people with correct information. Uh, digital literacy, and then I think maybe you guys can't do this, but you should tell me if it's the case, I'm, this is the FEC. Um, no pressure. Um, can, can the FEC publish guidelines on how to detect bias in political advertising? Like educational information. Uh, we do have the opportunity to do educational. Okay, all right. So but we, I don't so know. Exactly. If, you could, if you could actually do it. Yeah, so, so, so we included a recommendation along those lines. At least I'm glad it's at least feasible. Um, in the learning side, um, studies on impact. I just think there's an enormous amount we don't know here. Um, there are opportunities, I think, for experimental programs and pilot programs. Actually, the recent Senator Thune legislation, one thing I was really enthused to see is it proposed pilot programs, which I think is a fantastic idea, because even then, if the policy regime is problematic, we're gathering data that enables us to learn and figure out how to design optimal policy in the future. Um, ad archives, not just published by companies, but actually published by state and the federal government so that you can see the entire ecosystem, not just what's happening in terms of political ads on a couple of different platforms. And then sub-vendor reporting, which is um, about uh, essentially about advertising transparency. And if I could add just one quick footnote to what uh, Matt said, because I think it's an important point. A lot of people seem to think they're new AI problems, and so therefore we, knew, yeah. we need new AI legislation to deal with them. Mm -hmm. Like, we have a bunch of existing rules on the book. If civil rights are being violated through AI, like, you can actually prosecute those alleged crimes uh, through civil rights laws. In this campaign, we know they're going to be billions of dollars raised, which means there's going to be an extraordinary amount of consumer fraud that takes place through uh, campaign uh, vehicles. Uh, there is a lot of fraud legislation that's already on the books. So I like to tell people, like, there are some uh, problems that are unique to AI, and we do need legislation to uh, deal with them, but we do have a bunch of existing laws that just need to be applied. We need to enforce them. We need to start prosecuting uh, the worst offenders. If I could... I want to go back to the discussion that it, uh, regarding harm and how are we assessing harm because we, we have instances in local elections and we have instances in international elections where this deceptive AI, these deep fakes that everybody's probably waiting for us to say deep fake, deep fake, you know, make sure I don't say it too much before the word becomes something else, <laughs> is that 
I think that there have been examples in the Slovakia election where misinformation was put out, not misinformation, let me, yes, misinformation. Make sure I get my right words right because it's confusing to all of us. But disinformation that's put out two days during the moratorium period when nothing is supposed to be put out before polls open, there's actual evidence that this had an impact upon that election. We can look at the local mayoral election for Chicago where deep fakes by audio were put out and that had an actual impact. So I appreciate what you were saying about how do we measure it? But maybe that's the, the, the conversation that I'd like to, to get some answer about. Because I see these instances happening in international elections, local elections. We also, you just mentioned about um, the effort to bring uh, black voters um, to disenfranchise in the way by disencouragement from showing up at the polls. And you just had the BBC reporting just last week where you had fake images that were posted with former President Trump and black males that you just mentioned were being highlighted, um, and then black people that are being highlighted. How do we go about measuring the harm for those type mm. of things? Because the two elections that I noted, that's harm. But we, what we're trying to really talk about, at least in the selfish perspective, is how to prevent that harm happening in our election. Great, no, those are definitely uh, great points. Another risk that I think people are worried about in 2024 in the United States is the risk of foreign intervention. When you think about it, the number of countries around the world that, one, see this as a high-stakes election for them, i.e., you know, if America elects fewer politicians willing to send military assistance to Ukraine, Putin wins. So Russia has a clear candidate in mind. You can kind of go down the roster, China, Iran, uh, the Saudis, North Korea, and so on. How do we handle the risk of foreign interventions from a number of different uh, countries? How do we deal with the threats that are coming from outside U.S. jurisdiction, meaning any law, regulation, or whatever that the FEC passes or Congress passes or state legislatures pass, like, they don't apply to Russia? How do we deal with this issue of foreign threats? Everyone's looking at me? Okay. Um, we already have a foreign national ban, so that money cannot be directly used. It cannot be used by subsidiaries that are controlled predominantly or that a foreign national has involvement in the decision-making in regards to that. But I think the question is going more to the surreptitious actions that are being done. And that's not one that you're dealing with legitimate actors that want to be announced that they're working and that they intend to file reports with my agency. These are the, the right? They don't announce. The, the, Russia didn't announce what it was doing in 2016. It did it and spent the money and everything. So. It's really, I feel like I'm on the, the hot seat for this one because I don't have an answer because a bad actor is not going to announce that they want to be a bad actor. They're going to do it. And they're going to do it, in my belief, likelihood right before an election occurs where there's less time to combat the information that's come out. Maybe I'll add, you know, uh, just a comment on that uh, question. You know, all of these, you know, the regulations that we have on, you know, some of the models developed, you know, in the U.S., let's say we are, you know, saying that, okay, maybe everyone should do watermarking, even though I, you know, I don't think that's a solution. Uh, but uh, foreign countries, there are many open source models, and they, they can do whatever, right? So they can create uh, content, you know, without, you know, some of these watermarking signatures, um, and unfortunately, you know, or fortunately, there is no wall for information flow, so that you know, content can uh, flood in um, or social media. So that's why I think we shouldn't, you know, think about one size fits all type of a solution in order to mitigate risk. And perhaps we should think about more robust, uh, multifaceted uh, ways to uh, combat uh, the, the, the issues and risk. Uh, specific to the application and specific to the domains, to not uh, have this limited scope, but also consider uh, strong adversarial um, ad adversaries that can uh, basically try to uh, manipulate, uh, manipulate voters in the U.S. Matt? Yeah. I definitely don't have a, a silver bullet on this one. I mean, it's obviously an incredibly challenging issue. Um, I, d I do think tech com this is an issue where tech company collaboration has been relatively effective. Um, certainly also um, in CISA and the federal government, there's been active attention to foreign interference. And I think hopefully there will be continued investment in that area. Um, I do think, I mean, um, 
obviously this issue is critically important, but I also think it's important to recognize some of the value of foreign speech in an election context in the United States. So I, my understanding, you should correct me if I'm wrong, but is um, that foreign spending directly on for political candidates or with respect to individual pieces of legislation is prohibited. But general social and political issue advertising is not. And that, I think, actually makes some sense. Like, there may be value in uh, European environmental organizations being able to run ads in an American election about climate change. That's a, climate change is a global issue, not just a, an American issue. Um, so I do think it's important that when, while we pay attention to coordinated um, foreign behavior that is directed at influencing and interfering with an American election, that we don't initiate laws that censor speech in ways that are problematic when there are important values for foreigners to be able to um, give voice to. Okay, uh, we're going to move to some questions from uh, the audience. Uh, there are actually is uh, one question that already has come in from our online audience, and uh, shortly I'll take any questions that uh, you may have here within the auditorium. Uh, this question comes from Shamhu Dot, who actually works in the India Election Commission. And I mentioned India is voting this year, so uh, he is uh, worried about this uh, topic. Uh, I actually did a webinar on disinformation for a Japanese audience just a couple months ago, there were like 15,000 people online watching it. So this is not an American problem. Uh, and, and the question is, uh, this per person points out, disinformation has become a global phenomena and as such poses a major challenge. What are the best practices adopted to neutralize the challenge? Any thoughts from our panelists? Um, maybe I'll start. You know, I. Um, I think first, you know, we should uh, think about, you know, what are the what are the tools that are effective and what are the tools that are not effective. As I mentioned, relying on detectors, uh, which are, you know, unreliable, that's not a solution. But we can think about, you know, some uh, robust solutions for, for example, for spread of misinformation and disinformation on social media. Uh, the, having some information about the digital provenance of the content that we see on social media. That means where this content is coming from and whether or not compared to the source, compared to the original uh, content, there has been like a manipulation uh, on the content that we are seeing. I think that information can be very useful uh, for, for, for the users. Uh, if the source is a verified uh, account versus if it is, some, it is coming from uh, a, pro, a, a questionable uh, account. Uh, in addition to that, education campaign just to showcase how deep fake can be used on social media uh, for, for the general public. I, I, I think you know, for, for all of you here, and perhaps for, for our uh, virtual audience, it's a trivial problem. But for many ordinary people, they may not uh, have observed or they may not have really digested the power of such uh, generative models and generative content, that how realistic they can, they can look like. So I think having such education campaign can go a long way. Uh, maybe for election 2024, we can start it you know, today if it hasn't been started. But in fact, if we could have such um, educational courses in our high schools, in our uh, even middle schools, to basically uh, teach some critical uh, way of thinking about digesting information that we see on social media. I think that is a more robust way to combat this rather than relying on some other re unreliable AI models to solve all of these problems for us. And for example, in the tobacco smoking area, public education campaigns actually work. Like smoking levels really drop. That's the good news. The bad news is it took, what, 30 years to get to that point. <laughs> well, hopefully not that long because we have an election in, what, eight months. Um, but I, I want to jump on to the education ban rule because I do think that we can see in individual states they have stepped up their, uh, their education campaigns. I might be saying it wrong, but the North Carolina Black Voter Alliance um, put out a pamphlet that talked about uh, in, in terms that Every day, people can understand to highlight what you're looking at, um, to also give you a perspective to pay attention when you're listening to the audio versus the visual. You know, we've all seen the the, uh, the visual ads that had the three arms. 
or that had Kate Middleton, everyone, anyone heard about her, um, that had her picture where the shirts and everything. So we've become sophisticated in a way that we can identify those kind of telltale signs. But the North Carolina Black Voter Alliance, I hope I'm saying it right because it was a really great um, information, was also telling to highlight, listen to the audios. Audio from what they were writing becomes easier to sneak into people. Because we look for, we look at pictures, we, we stare at that, but how many times are you talking to someone that you skip half the words that they're saying? I do, I hate to admit it, but you could then be trapped into paying attention. I actually encountered one of the individuals that had received the robocall mm -hmm. for New Hampshire at an event I was at last month, and this is a person that works in this industry, and what I thought was interesting is that she didn't think there was anything wrong with it. Um, other people might have been more sufficient. It said Bidenisms. It said stuff that he says. So, you know, there's malarkey in there, and she thought it was great. But until she was told not to go vote, and that's what kind of sparked for her. So I do think that there should be active efforts on a state level to educate our voters. There's active level on the state to talk about election administration and how we can improve on that and make sure that our voters or the people that are, are heading these polls for us are going to be safe. I think this is another avenue that I believe states are going to need to step up for. So in that New Hampshire case, the person was not affected by the fake audio tape? She personally, uh, but she received the call. And, and, and then when the news came out, she was kind of like, oh, <laughs> uh, I guess it wasn't malarkey, so, um, yeah. So yeah. In, India is an, an interesting example, I think, because India has been on the decline on free expression issues over the last decade or so. And I think that's an important thing to keep in mind in this area, people using misinformation generally and misinformation in AI as an opportunity to enforce increasingly restrictive uh, expression, uh, to, to enforce incre inc increasingly restrictive expression laws in ways that might violate international law on free, uh, related to free expression. Um, a second issue here, I think, is one that I think will be probably like a long journey, which is how do we treat information that comes at us via LLMs as opposed to the last generation of information and technology platforms that we saw? And I think it's fundamentally different. I think someone posting something on X or on Instagram or on TikTok, that is not the same. We don't have the same expectations or we should not have the same expectations for the information that's rendered to us in Google search, for instance, that, uh, versus the information that we get uh, in response to a chatbot. And so, in recent weeks, there's been active controversy between Google and the government of India related to information that was surfaced in Gemini um, about whether Prime Minister Modi is a fascist or not. Um, my reading of the text is that the text is actually accurate information. The text says something like, um, there are people who have raised arguments, or sometimes the point is made that. And so I actually think it's conceivable that it's accurate. Whether it's accurate or not, it does seem to me that it, I don't think we're at a point right now, and maybe it will change at some point in the future, where we're looking to chatbots to deliver accurate information. It's one data source. It's not definitive data. Um, I do think while we're in the current moment, there's a question about whether policymakers um, treat uh, LLMs as if they are encyclopedias, as if they are sort of intended to deliver truthful information. That doesn't strike me as the right way to frame the technology or the right way to think about the regulatory regime that we should apply to it. And I would like to point out one positive case from a global standpoint where disinformation did not work. I always try to include a little bit of optimism in discussion of this topic. Sometimes I joke with audiences that I can do optimism or pessimism, and you know, what would you like to hear? Uh, but the optimistic example is the recent Taiwan examples, where there was incredible foreign intervention from China in that election, and the China-backed candidate did not win. So it is possible for people to stand up to disinformation. It is possible for people to be educated. Uh, but it takes, I think, a pretty sustained effort to uh, reach that point. We have one more question from our online audience, and then I'll take some uh, questions from uh, people here. Uh, Valerie uh, Bunce, uh, a retired political science professor from Cornell University, asks, how can members of Congress be educated about disinformation? You should take my course. <laughs> I, I actually th so I think the presumption there is that members of Congress don't know enough about disinformation. I'm sure that's the case. I don't know enough about disinformation. Um, I'm sure you know members of Congress. There's always stuff that, that people can learn. I, I I do think it is important though to give 
uh, members of Congress credit for the development that they've made in understanding technology over the last decade or so and how that's been reflected in various different congressional hearings. Um, if you look at the series of hearings on content moderation or the series of hearings on antitrust over the, over, uh, you know, the, the last decade, the level of sophistications of the questions, I think, has really shifted. The level of detail and understanding of products and technologies has really changed. So, I, of course, there's more to learn, but I actually think um, it's important to give credit to members of Congress and their staffers for um, developing deeper and deeper expertise in this area. And I would say in the last six months, there are a lot of people on Capitol Hill who have woken up. I mean, just the number of requests I and various colleagues around Brookings have gotten from Capitol Hill for briefings on AI, and particularly in relation to uh, the election, has just skyrocketed. So there's definitely a lot of interest. There's uh, a lot of uh, outreaching on the part of uh, people on Capitol Hill to try and talk to people who have studied these issues. Actually, I have one other, one other thought about it. You may have more first-person experience on this than I did. I didn't testify at the um, Senator Schumer's AI Insight Forums, but one thing that I read about and heard about from various different people is how impactful they were because they were private. So members were not, uh, what, again, what I heard was members were, not, were posturing less. There's less of a desire to get the, the three-second clip that you can use for fundraising and more of, a, a, of an opportunity and a desire to yeah. understand in more detail, to, to learn from the people who they had brought together. And so it does seem to me like I, there's always a push to transparency. Transparency, I think there, there's a lot, there are a lot of instances where transparency is good, but exclusively conducting policy development in transparent processes I think is not always effective. And more of those kinds of forums where they can really be free to ask um, different kinds of questions, questions that they might not you know, want to, for public consumption, I think is a valuable direction. I think in private, legislators and their staffs are more willing to ask basic questions, mm -hmm. which they might not want to do publicly. But either of you, any thoughts on how to educate members of Congress? No, I think that was a great answer. Um, I, I am appreciative of the fact that when people acknowledge what they don't know, you know, everyone is embarrassed to sit there and say that they don't know things. I, I, I'm going to probably ask you a, a definition of something that after this ends. But there has been an amazing step up in the last couple of months to to get to a level playing field and a way to understand what's going on. I, I hope that they continue to do that. And I'll just add, you know, I have, you know, had several conversations with the legislators about AI regulations. I, sh you know, should say they have been extremely open about, you know, that, that this area is very technical, uh, acknowledging that. And I think that's one of the issues in uh, creating uh, verifiable regulation in this domain because uh, the, the, the issues are quite te technical, uh, but we also need some regulations in order to mitigate some of these risks. And, you know, I'm happy that there have been a lot of uh, conversations between the legislators and, you know, more technical people, and I hope that continues in the future. And, and I think you're right. One of the particular challenges of anything related to AI is it actually combines the need for technical, legal, and policy knowledge. Mm -hmm. There are lots of people who have a technical background. There are people who have the legal background. There are people who have the policy background. There aren't that many people who cut across that. And that's actually what we need to deal with some of these issues. Uh, let's open the floor to questions here. Uh, my colleague, Elaine Kmark, my colleague and co-author on a forthcoming disinformation book. Thank you. Thank you. You forgot to give the title, Daryl. <laughs> <laughs> the title is Lies That Kill, mm -hmm. A Citizen's Guide to Disinformation. And we, as you can imagine from the, after the colon, we spend a lot of time on the education, educating citizens to, to see this. But I have sort of a technical question that um, hopefully somebody can answer. Um, you talked about detectors, okay? Um, can you explain in layman's language what the problem is in getting effective detectors? And then... Can you give us an idea of how long it might take before we can have a detector on our laptop, just like we have a McCaffrey virus, you know, thing or something like that that says, hey, something's going on here? Because that would be just great if we could have that. Is this pie in the sky? And, and what can we expect? Uh, fantastic. So, so detectors, uh, these are uh, models that can tell us whether a content is real or AI generated, right? And usually, like, there are different families of these detectors, but you can think about them as looking at the content to see if there are some signatures uh, that is not 
basically authentic signatures. So these are some of the signatures left on the content, on the image and the video. Some of them may be visible. Uh, for example, maybe you guys have seen that uh, image of uh, Trump with black voters and you know, one of the people, they had only four fingers mm -hmm. uh, or three fingers. So some, some of them can be visible and we can basically use that in order to say, okay, so this is not real. Uh, but in many cases, um, the, the signal, uh, the signature may be invisible. Uh, so the problem is that now the current generative models, they don't leave much signature on the content. So basically we don't have anything to work with in order to use that in, in detection. So watermarking is a way to solve this. Basically, uh, watermarking is embedding some sort of signature in the, in the content so that we can use it in order to detect. But that can also be erased quite effectively. Mm -hmm. So that's basically the first part. So the second part, unfortunately, I don't think we will ever have a detector on our laptop to reliably tell us if this is content real or fake. Um, that's, a, that's a fundamental issue because basically the quality of these generative models, they, they're increasing every day, meaning that they don't leave that much signature from the model onto the content, then we don't have anything to work with. Okay, uh, back yeah. there on the- Sorry uh, about that. I have one, oh, Charles, okay. Uh, uh, yes, my name is Roger Cochetti, and I'm an editorial contributor on technology and space policy for the Hill newspaper. And one of the issues I've been trying to come to grips with, the panel has kind of touched on this, is what are the circumstances and the criteria under which we should distinguish between exactly the same thing if it occurs by a human using just natural human activities versus um, something that's enabled by artificial intelligence. So the panel has already acknowledged that misinformation, deception, and impersonation have been part of politics since ancient Greece. It's nothing new. But to make my question very specific, so it's harder to duck it, um, if I... You'd be if, surprised at our ability to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, really. If I, if I turn on my YouTube video and I watch an impersonator of Nancy Pelosi perfectly impersonating her, not a computer, and the impersonation says, I want to vote for Donald Trump and I want all of you to. And then I watch another video of, a YouTube video of Nancy Pelosi, which is an artificially created one. Um, from the viewer's point of view, they are exactly the same thing. But should the authorities, the Federal Electric Commission in particular, treat one as a parody and natural ridicule and perfectly fine, it's laughable, and the other one is a serious crime that shouldn't be tolerated. So, and if there is a difference between personal impersonation and artificial impersonation, what are the criteria? What are the boundaries? How, how do we know? You know, what's the, because from the viewer's point of view, there's no difference. Impersonation has been around forever. Thank you. Great question. Thank you. Panelists? Again, but thanks for the easy ones, guys. Um, <laughs> so there is a, the difference is, is parody, satire, individual versus taking the images of another to make them act the way you want to. The ability to be able to control as it relates to this technology, I believe, would have a greater possibility as opposed to being the ability to be able to take away someone's free speech, someone's expression, those type of things. It, I think that for me, and only, I always have to say this, this is the caveat, I'm just one of the six people that make decisions up there. That is a very distinguishing difference. But a little bit, and, and this is my pivot away so I can get away from that one, is that you have to look at the recent bill that Klobuchar and Murkowski put out. And what that put out is that when you're dealing with the AI, simple little technical and conforming things that I call it can be okay. 
it's substantial changes that we would be looking at. And that has to, if, if that becomes legislation that comes to my agency and we have to define what that means, and substantial changes are when you have the responsibility to go to that disclaimer route. But that is, that's one of those things I'm happy to talk to you more one-on-one -on -one about my thoughts on it. But speaking on behalf of the agency, that's, that's all I can say is one of six, one six. Um, I, I don't believe there is a difference, and I, I actually don't think that we should put much weight on whether there's a difference. I don't know why it matters what tool someone uses to develop a video and whether that's an LLM or Photoshop or they're drawing with their hands. That's why the focus in our report was on regulating harms, not technology. So if there's something harmful about the content that's produced, regulate that. We should care about voter suppression, I think. I don't think we should care about the means of, the means of production of voter suppression. And we'll give you the last word on this. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, in, there's a spectrum, right? You know, speaking, for example, of uh, LLMs, you know, generating text, uh, you can uh, have a, a text fully generated by an AI model, or you can have a text, you know, maybe generated by human and edited by AI. Uh, so the, the final output, is it AI generated? Is it human generated? So it becomes really uh, uh, fuzzy in this spectrum. And I agree, I don't think we should uh, police and we should look at the, uh, the impact of it. If it is you know, a harmful content, no matter how it is generated, the, the person who is putting that content out there should uh, be responsible for that content. Either it is you know, generated by that, by that person or that person has used some tools in order to uh, generate that content. Let me finish this. The main thing that the purpose of the Federal Election Commission is to, in my opinion, is to promote transparency. So while I agree that we want to be worried about the, the content of it, from the perspective of what I am charged to do, my mission is to make sure you're aware who was behind the content that you're seeing. So there's a distinguishing factor between what's included in it and who's responsible for it. And that is really the charge of the agency is who's responsible for the communications that you are seeing. Well, we will make that the coda on this discussion, <laughs> but I want to thank uh, Shauna, Sohio, and Matt for sharing your views. Uh, here at Brookings, we have lots of other uh, discussions, uh, papers, and books coming out on this uh, topic uh, over uh, the coming uh, months. We write regularly about uh, tech issues. You can find our work on our Tech Tank blog as well as our Tech Tank uh, podcast, uh, both located at brookings.edu. So thank you very much for attending our event.